chapter 1, reading from verse 12 right through to chapter 2, verse 1. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pull, pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet. And so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. This is the reading from God's Word. Let us uh, bow our heads in prayer for a moment. Gracious God, we, we have your word before us this morning. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we can turn to it at any time. We praise you, Lord, for all the books of the Bible that you've given to us. We, we can say, as the Lord Jesus said, your word is truth. And we know, as, again, as the psalmist spoke of your word being a lamp unto his feet and a light unto his path. We praise you, Lord, that the entrance of your word gives light. And therefore, gracious God, this morning, we thank you for the Holy Spirit who moved men to write these words, and we pray now for the help of the Holy Spirit in being able to open these words and to be able to understand them and apply them, Lord, to our own hearts and situations. We pray, Lord, that you would therefore give us light and understanding and help us, Lord, in all that we consider here this morning in your word. Graciously hear us, we pray, as we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I wonder if you've uh, ever found yourself saying or heard others say something like this. I'm not interested in dry, dusty doctrine I just want to know how to live my Christian life. If you've ever heard that said, or maybe even if you've ever thought that or said it yourself, I want to suggest that that is a big mistake for two reasons at least. First of all, because Bible doctrine is anything but dry and dusty and less badly taught. And the second reason is that the Christian life cannot be lived without doctrine. It's a bit like saying, I'm not interested in the boring highway code and the driving theory and rules of the road. I just want to get out on the road and drive. That would be foolish, wouldn't it? What do we mean then when we talk about doctrine? Well, doctrine basically is a set of truths about God, about God's character, what we call his attributes, what God is like. We have doctrines in the Bible, truths in the Bible about sin and salvation and much more, as I say, all of them based upon God's own revelation in the Bible. And we need to remember this as we continue in our series in the book of Habakkuk. You may remember that on the very first page of this book, how that the prophet began by crying out to God, How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look on injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflicts abounds. 
We found, didn't we, that uh, he so much wanted God to listen to his prayers and to act. But when at last the answer did come, it was totally unexpected. He wanted God to answer, but not in this way. For this was the answer that the Lord gave. I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people. And so now we come to Habakkuk's second complaint, which we have recorded in chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. This is in response to the Lord's answer to Habakkuk's first complaint. And I think what's really striking is that even though Habakkuk is in a state, we might say, of bewilderment and shock, he doesn't begin with feeling sorry for himself. He doesn't begin with poor me. His approach is a good example for believers at whatever time they live in history. He begins with what he knows about God. He begins with his doctrine of God. And so the first thing I want to say is that he reminds himself of who the Lord is. And this comes in verses 12 and 13. <clears throat> Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Notice the very first word, Lord. And notice the personal way in which he addresses the Lord. If we were to pick it out from those verses, he speaks of him as my God, my Holy One, my rock. That's very personal, isn't it? This was a deeply distressing time for Habakkuk as he tried to come to terms with the fact that the Lord was going to use the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people, as the text says, to chastise his own people, Judah. And yet, perplexed as Habakkuk was, that, that bond between him and the Lord hadn't been broken. The affection that he felt towards the Lord hadn't cooled. My God, my Holy One, my Rock. And like ourselves too, when, when we feel perplexed and distressed in times of difficulty in our personal lives, in our family, in our church or country, we need to remind ourselves, don't we, of who the Lord is. We need to remind ourselves of who the Lord is from what we're told about him in the Bible. Those, we might say, those basic, fundamental, doctrinal truths. Those truths concerning who the Lord is, eternal and holy. What he has done in the past and continues to do in the present and what he will yet do in the future. We need to take encouragement from the fact that although everything else may change and the world itself may be in turmoil, one thing we can count on for sure, and that is that the Lord does not change. We read this in the very last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, where the Lord himself says, I am the Lord, I do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Or maybe our mind goes, when we hear a verse like that, our mind runs to the New Testament and to the, and to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 13, verse 8, where we read, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. So although may, when everything is in flux, when everything is uncertain, there are these certainties that we know about God, about the Father and about the Son, that they do not change. Habakkuk addressed the Lord with these, with these words of warm affection around 2,700 years before Christ. My God, my Holy One, my Rock. And Christians living now more than 2,000 years after the death and resurrection of Christ can do the same. So that whatever happens, however difficult life becomes, 
Nothing will change this for the believer. The believer can affirm with Habakkuk, you are my God, my Holy One, my Rock. These are truths to remind ourselves of. Truths to give us a firm footing for our slipping feet. Truths to help us to rest easy at night and to help us to face another day. That's a great theme, isn't it? The idea of rock. It's used many, many times in the Bible. Moses sang of this rock to the whole assembly of Israel in Deuteronomy 32. He said, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. Oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Or you might recall Hannah when dedicating her son Samuel to serve the Lord included these words in her, prayer, in her prayer. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. Or the psalmist often speaks about the Lord as my rock. David, for example, in Psalm 18 says, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, and my stronghold. And of course, we just sang it, didn't we? We love to sing, don't we? Remind ourselves of the gospel, of our salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. We love to sing, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Habakkuk prays, Lord, are you not from everlasting? He reminds himself that although he is like all of us, a mere mortal, God is everlasting. He cannot die. He will not die. He's from eternity to eternity. And that's an awesome thought, isn't it? To dwell on that thought, to meditate on that thought of the eternal God that we worship. The fact that God is, is holy means that he can do nothing unholy. So that even when he uses unholy people, for example here, like the Babylonians, in order to chasten his own people, Judah. He doesn't compromise his holy character. He is never the author of sin. And so Habakkuk, in all his perplexity and distress at the Lord's purposes, in acting as he did in answer to his prayers, he remembers and he reaffirms his deepest convictions about the Lord. And we too can and must do the same. If we trust in this one true and living God, the unchangeable God, we can do the same. So that's the first thing we see here. He reminds himself of who the Lord is. But secondly, he returns to asking the Lord why. Do you recall the words of the opening words of this prophecy? What we call Habakkuk's complaint. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflicts, conflict abounds. Well, here it is again. In a sense, back to where he started. In a similar frame of mind, asking similar questions. We've noticed that he began his prayer so well, didn't he? Reminding himself of who the Lord is. But he soon returned to complaining to the Lord and questioning his ways. Look at verse 13. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Can you see again? Why? 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 And he follows this up by giving an example, example after example of the, the wickedness and the ferocity of the Babylonians in destroying nation after nation, including his own beloved Judah. The Babylonians were, were known for their, their extreme ferocity and cruelty towards captives. We know from history that they, they would drag them off 
strung together with hooks thrust through their lower lips. And Habakkuk seems to be referring to this in verse 15 when he says, the wicked pulls all of them up with hooks. And he ends his complaint here with a question concerning another example of the cruelty of the Babylonians who thought nothing more of killing people than of catching fish. Look there at verse 17. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying nations without mercy? When we read these words, we, we may be surprised at just how quickly Habakkuk changed from such a, a positive view, re reminding himself of who the Lord is, my God, my Holy One, my Rock, to such a negative view, to returning to asking the question, why? But you know, friends, it shouldn't surprise us, should it? If we know the fickleness of our own hearts, aren't we, after all, often a mass of contradictions? One day affirming our faith confidently and with great assurance, acknowledge, acknowledging God as my God, my Holy One, my Rock. But then the very next day, maybe even the same day, we find that we are, we are full of, of doubt and uncertainty, like Habakkuk, questioning the purposes of God in our lives, of those we love or the state of the country, as we see it in all its spiritual and moral decline. And none of us are, are prophets like Habakkuk. But if you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, you know that you're, you're fragile and fallible, just like him. Like him, given to times of doubts and fears, inconsistencies, and massive contradictions. But like Habakkuk, if you're like Habakkuk, you can and must pray. Like him, you can be sure that your Father in heaven who hears your prayers understands you completely. And he is one in whom you can trust unreservedly. Love those words of prophecy in that remarkable book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. How tender the words in Isaiah concerning the coming Messiah, chapter 42. The coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. It speaks there, a bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. Or Jesus himself, you know, in Matthew's Gospel, that we read it earlier, that, that wonderful invitation where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. What a great text that is. And we quite rightly use this text as an invitation from the Lord Jesus, ringing down the ages for sinners to come to him a first time in repentance and faith for the forgiveness of sins for peace with God, to be reconciled to God. Have you done that? Have you come to Jesus Christ? You must, if you would be right with God. So we use that text quite rightly in that way. But, but a Christian too, when oftentimes full of doubts and uncertainty, weary and burdened, needs to come to Jesus again and again, confident that we, he will never turn us away but will give us a warm welcome. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So firstly, Habakkuk reminds himself of who the Lord is. Secondly, he returns to asking the question, why? And thirdly, he resolves to wait for the Lord's Lord to answer. He resolves to wait for the Lord to answer. We might be quite shocked at uh, Habakkuk's boldness. Uh, we might even say there's a kind of uh, brazenness in his prayer. I don't think we can quite charge uh, Habakkuk with, um, with uh, saying that, uh, that the Lord is, is responsible for sin. But he does sail very close to the wind, doesn't he? Very close to the wind indeed. And he seems to be very conscious of this. He seems to be aware of this because of what he says at the beginning of chapter 2. 
I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look and see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Another version, the revised authorised version, puts it this way. I will stand my watch and set myself on the ramparts and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am reproved. So it seems that Habakkuk is, uh, he's, he's made his prayer, he's, he's been bold in prayer and now he's waiting for the answer and he is at least half expecting that the Lord will reprove him. He seems to be bracing himself for a reply. He was expecting a reply. He was expecting a reply because he knew that God answers prayer. You may be familiar that uh, in ancient times and certainly in Bible times in the Old Testament, watchmen uh, in those days uh, kept a lookout for the enemy from the walls of the city. Night and day they would be watching, keeping an eagle eye on over the horizon to see if anyone was coming, see if the enemy was, was approaching. Now, I doubt if Habakkuk was looking for anything visual or expecting the Lord to appear to him in some form or, or send him an angel with a message. But however it came, we can be sure that Habakkuk expected to hear from the Lord. That he was sure that the Lord had heard him and he would give him an answer. We might speculate, how long did Habakkuk have to wait for an answer? Was it days or weeks or even longer? We don't know. But what we do know for sure is that when the answer came, it was in the Lord's time, perfectly suited to Habakkuk in his distress and his perplexity. It seems that Habakkuk was saying something similar to the writer of Psalm 130. That psalm begins like this, Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my cry. Let your ears be attentive to my cry. Or later in that psalm, verse 6, I wait for the Lord. More than the watchman, wait for the morning. More than the watchman, wait for the morning. And I ask you, and as I, I ask myself, when you pray, do you, like Habakkuk, expect an answer? Do you resolve to wait upon the Lord for an answer? Do you persevere in prayer or soon lose heart? You know, the devil wants us to give up on prayer. He'd love to see us prayerless. He'd love to see us going days and weeks and maybe months without really praying. Contrast that with our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. What can we say about Jesus? So many things, but certainly he was a man of prayer. We read about that again and again in the Gospels, even getting up a day, a great deal before it was daybreak and going out to a quiet place and praying. Jesus was a man of prayer. And Jesus, indeed, in heaven itself, is still a man of prayer. He ever lives to make intercession for us. He's our great high priest, our advocate on high. Now the devil wants us to give up on prayer, but our Saviour Jesus Christ wants us to persevere, to keep praying. As he says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And these are the words of David in Psalm 27, which the Lord's people in every time and every generation, the world over, can repeat with David. And I close with these words. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. And wait for the Lord. Let us pray.
Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that although we live so many, many centuries away from the time when these words of Habakkuk were first spoken, we praise you, Lord, that you are the Lord and you do not change. You are the still the same prayer hearing, prayer answering God. We praise you, Lord, for that reminder this morning. We pray, Lord, that we would persist in prayer, that we would keep waiting, we would keep knocking, keep asking, keep calling upon you. Give us strength, Lord, give us patience. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Gracious, kind, merciful, good. Thank you that you are the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Saviour of sinners. And it is through him that we can come to you this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray that you would help us to remember it, take it to heart, meditate upon it, turn to it again, Lord, maybe today, into the days of the weeks, the week ahead. Lord, we thank you that your word is indeed a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And therefore, Lord, we pray that you'd help us to take that light, take that lamp to shine on our path in the days of the week ahead. Thank you for our time together and ask, Lord, that you would now graciously hear us as we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.